message is kind of a continuation from last week. You'll see the knee touch the hurt. How many can, who can tell me what uh, the message was about last week? Uh, the passage of scripture that we dealt with. Anybody remember? <laughs> Peter and John, and they went up to the temple to pray. They met a lame man on the way. He reached out his palm and asked for an arm, and this is what Peter did say. Certainly gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, Nazareth, rise up and walk. Went walking with him, praising God. It's a song that we used to always sing in the water program, and it's uh, one that my daughter said last week during the middle of the message. She said immediately that song came to mind, and she couldn't get out of her head the rest of the message. So what are the <laughs> some others? Um, so one of the words, the key words that we looked at last week was the word compassion. Since that's kind of a key part of the message today, that's why this is kind of a continuation. But who can tell me what you learned about the word compassion last week that maybe you hadn't heard before? Because it's one of the more odd words in Scripture. What made it odd? Do you remember? Splanchnology. Does that ring a bell? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the study of the visceral parts. So, in reality, it's like getting kicked in the stomach, like getting kicked in the gut. So, to, to really experience compassion is to have that, just to be so overcome with emotion, you know, as you feel for somebody, what they're going through, and you enter into their story, so to speak. So, that's a little bit of what we looked at last week. Today, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 8, the healing of a leper. And the title of the message today is A Compassionate Touch. But before we look at our text and get into that, I want you to do something with me. I want you to look at your hand for a moment. I don't care which hand it is. I don't care if it's your left hand or your right hand. It doesn't really matter. I want you to start by looking at the back of your hand. You can see the wrinkles and the... <laughs> Some more than others. The rough skin for the knuckles, you know. Uh, turn it over, look at the palm of your hand and the lines there and, you know, the weathered hands and all of that. Reacquaint yourself with your fingers. Um, I want you to imagine for just a moment that some, if someone were to film a documentary about your hand, Okay? And what if a producer were to tell your story based on the life of your hands? What would we see? As with all of us, the film would begin with a, a tiny little infant's fist. Maybe a close-up of a tiny hand wrapped around a mother's finger. But then what? Maybe holding on to the edge of a chair as... First learn to walk, maybe handling that spoon for the first time, trying to get the food into your mouth. It wouldn't be too long into the feature before we would start seeing your hand being affectionate, maybe stroking the side of your daddy's face or petting a puppy. But neither is it very long before we would see your hand acting aggressively, pushing a brother or a sister, or yanking a toy from another child. You see, all of us learn early on that the hand is suited for more than just survival. It's a tool of emotional expression. We've all heard the expression, some people can't talk without using their hands. I sometimes fall into that. The same hand can hurt or heal, extend or clinch, can lift someone up or shove someone down. If you were to show the documentary to your friends, you'd be proud of certain moments, like when your hand is extending with a gift, when your hand is placing a ring on a finger, when your hand is doctoring a wound or preparing a meal or folding together in prayer at the bedside of a child. But then there would also be other scenes, shots of accusing fingers, 
or abusive fists, hands that are taking more than they're giving, demanding instead of offering, wounding rather than loving. Oh, the power of our hands. Leave them unmanaged and they become weapons, clawing for powers, strangling for survival, seducing for pleasure, but manage them and our hands can become instruments of grace. Not just tools in the hand of God, mind you, but God's hands extended. Surrender them to His control, and these five finger appendages become the hands of heaven. Because that's exactly what Jesus did in His life here on earth. Our Savior completely surrendered His hands to God. The documentary of His hands would have no scenes of greedy grabbing, no scenes of unfounded finger pointing. It does, however, have scene after scene after scene of people longing for his compassionate touch. Whether it was parents bringing their children to Jesus so he could lay his hands on them and bless them. Whether it was the, the poor bringing their fears. Whether it was the, the sick and the outcast wanting that divine touch or the sinful that were shouldering their sorrow. Each scene we would see as they came forward, each one would be touched and each one would be changed. But none was touched or changed more than the unnamed leper in Matthew chapter 8. There we find this story. Beginning of verse 1. When Jesus came down from the hill, great crowds followed him. Then a man with a skin disease came to Jesus. The man bowed down before him and said, Lord, you can heal me if you will. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man and said, I will be healed. And immediately the man was healed from his disease. Then Jesus said to him, Don't tell anyone about this, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded for people who are made well. This will show the people what I have done. I want to mention something about this story, and that's the fact that Mark and Luke also include this same story in their Gospels as well. But with apologies to all three of these Gospel writers, I must say that none of them tell us near enough. Yes, we know the man's disease. We know his decision to step out and basically confront Jesus. We know the results, the healing that occurred. But what about the rest of the story? We're left with questions, unanswered questions. The authors offer no name, no history, no description. And sometimes my curiosity gets the better of me. All too often I fall into a pattern that when I'm reading God's Word, I'm just simply reading it to be able to kind of check the end of the day, like, okay, this is my daily Bible reading for the day. I want to make sure I get it done. So I read through it and I kind of close the Bible and I'm done. I don't know if you do that or not. I'm hoping you're at least reading the Word, but, but sometimes I like to step back and just stop and try to visualize the scene that's taking place that I'm reading about. I try to put myself into the scenario, but not as an innocent bystander, mind you, but as the person who is receiving that divine touch from Jesus. When I was in seminary at Anderson back in 85, uh, taking a homiletics course, one of the things that the instructor told us, he said, when you come to a passage like this, he says, put yourself in the scene. Think about what you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you might even taste. Or in other words, live the moment that you're reading about. And so this is one of those times where my curiosity got the better of me. And so I want to just imagine this morning what might have happened to this man that's unnamed in Scripture who received this touch that changed his life forever. Perhaps his story went something like this. For five years, 
No one touched me. They saw me. They spoke to me. But they didn't touch me. No one. Not my wife. Not my daughter. Not my friends. I sensed love in their voices. I saw concern in their eyes, but I didn't feel their touch. There was no touch. Not once. What is common to you, I coveted. Handshakes. Warm embraces. A tap on the shoulder to get my attention. A kiss on the lips to steal a heart. Such moments were taken from my world. No one touched me. No one bumped into me accidentally. What I would have given to be bumped into or to be caught in a crowd for my shoulder to brush against someone else's. But for five years, it has not happened. How could it? I wasn't even allowed on the streets. Even the rabbis kept their distance from me. I was not permitted in my own synagogue. I'm not even welcome in my own house. I was untouchable. No one touched me until today. You see, it's stories like this that make me wonder about this unnamed man. Because in New Testament times, leprosy was a dreaded disease. The condition rendered the body a mass of ulcers and decay. Fingers would begin to curl and gnarl. Blotches of skin would discolor and stink. Certain types of leprosy would numb nerve endings, leading to a loss of fingers, toes, even a whole foot or hand. Leprosy was literally death by inches. The social consequences were as severe as the physical. Considered contagious, the leper was quarantined, banished to a leper colony away from the city. In scripture, the leper is symbolic of the ultimate outcast, infected by a condition he did not seek, Rejected by those he knew, avoided by people he did not know, condemned to a future that he could not bear. And in the memory of each outcast, there must have been that day when he was forced to face the truth that life would never be the same. Maybe that day went something like this. It was one year during the harvest that my grip on the side seemed weak, the tips of my fingers began came numb, first one finger, then another. And within a short time, I could grip the tool but scarcely feel it in my hands. By the end of the season, I felt nothing at all. Hand grasping the handle might as well have belonged to someone else, for the feeling was gone. I said nothing to my wife, but I knew she suspected something. I mean, how could she not? I held my lifeless hand against my body like a wound. It was one afternoon when I plunged my hands into a basin of water, intending just to wash my face, and I looked down and the water had reddened. How did I cut myself? I didn't even know I was wounded. Was it on a knife? Did my hand slide across the sharp edge of the metal? It must have, but I didn't feel anything. It's on your clothes, too, she said softly. She was behind me. Before looking at her, I looked down at the crimson spots on my robe. For the longest time, I stood there, staring at my hand, somehow knowing that my life was being forever altered. Shall I go with you to tell the priest, she asked. No. I'll go alone. Turned and looked into her moist eyes. Standing there next to her was our three year old daughter. Squatting down, I gazed into her face and stroked her cheek with my good hand, saying, What could I say? I stood up, looked again at my wife. She touched my shoulder. In my good hand, I touched hers. That would be our final touch. 
Five years have passed. No one, no one has touched me since until today. The priest didn't touch me. He looked at my hand, now wrapped in a rag. He looked at my face, now shadowed in sorrow. I've never faulted him for what he said. He was only doing as he was instructed. He covered his mouth with his one hand, extended the other palm outward, saying, you are unclean. With one pronouncement, I lost my family, my farm, my future, my friends. My wife met me at the city gates with a sack of clothing and bread and a few coins. She didn't speak. By now, friends had gathered, and what I saw in their eyes was a precursor to what I've seen in every eye since. Fearful fit. As I stepped out, they stepped back. Their horror of my disease was greater than their concern for my heart, so they and everyone else I've seen since stepped away. <clears throat> By today's standards, the banishing of a leper seems harsh, even unnecessary. The ancient East hasn't been the only culture to isolate their wounded, however. We may not build colonies or cover our mouths in their presence, but we certainly build walls and avert our eyes, and a person doesn't have to have leprosy to feel quarantined in our world today. The divorced know this feeling, so do the handicapped. The unemployed have felt it, as have the less educated. Some people shun unmarried moms. We keep our distance from the depressed and avoid the terminally ill. We have neighborhoods for immigrants, convalescent homes for the elderly, schools for the simple, centers for the addicted, prisons for the criminals. The rest simply try to get away from it all. Only God knows how many people live in voluntary exile. Individuals living quiet, lonely lives, infected by their fear of rejection and their memories of the last time that they tried to reach out only to be shunned. So they choose not to be touched at all rather than risk being hurt again. Five years of leprosy had left my hands in arm. I repulsed everyone who saw me. Tips of my fingers were missing, as were portions of an ear and parts of my nose. At the sight of me, fathers grabbed their children, mothers covered their faces, children would just point and stare. The rags of my body couldn't hide my sores any longer, nor could the wrap on my face hide the rage in my eyes. I didn't even try to hide it anymore. How many nights did I shake a gnarled fist at the silent sky, saying, what did I do to deserve this? But never a reply. Some think I sinned. Others think my parents sinned. I don't know. All I know is that I got tired of it all, sleeping in the colony, smelling the stench. I grew so tired of the damnable bell that I was required to wear around my neck to warn people of my presence as if I needed that. One glance and the announcements began. Unclean! Unclean! It was several weeks ago. I dared to walk the road to my village. I didn't have any intention of entering it. Heaven knows I only wanted to look again upon my fields, to gaze again upon my home, and, and by chance, perhaps, see the face of my wife again. I didn't see her, but I saw some children playing out in the pasture. I hid behind a tree and watched them scamper and run, and their faces were so joyful, their laughter was so contagious, that for a moment, for, for a brief moment, I was no longer left. I was a farmer, a father. I was a man again. Infused with this sudden burst of happiness, I stepped out from behind the tree, straightened my back, breathed deeply. And then they saw me. Before I could retreat, they saw me and screamed. They scattered. Except for one who lingered. She 
paused and looked at my direction. I, I don't know, and I can't say for sure, but I, I think, I really think it was my daughter. I don't know. I just had this sense that she was looking for her father. You see, it was that look, <coughs> that brief moment that made me take the step I took today. I know it was reckless. Of course it was risky, but what did I have to lose? He calls himself God's son. Either he will hear my complaint and kill me, or accept my demands and heal me. At least those were my thoughts. I came to him as a defiant man, moved not by faith, but by a desperate anger. God had brought this calamity on my body, and he would either fix it or end it. When I did, I, I was changed. You, you must remember, I'm a farmer, not a poet. I can't find words to describe what I saw. All I can say is this. Sometimes, a Judean morning is so fresh, and the sunrise is so glorious, that to look at them is to forget the heat of the day before, and all the hurt of times past. And when I looked at his face, I saw a Judean morning. Before he even spoke, I, I knew he cared. Somehow I knew he hated this disease as much as, you no, know, even more than I hated it. My rage became trust, my anger became hope, and from behind a rock I watched him descend the hill. Throngs of people followed him. I waited until he was only a few paces from me, and I stepped out. And I said, Master! He stopped. He looked in my direction. As did dozens of others, a flood of fear swept across the crowd. Arms flew out in front of faces. Children dug behind parents. Unclean, someone shouted. And I don't blame them. I was a huddled mass of death, but I scarcely heard them. I scarcely even saw them. Their panic I had seen a thousand times before, but his compassion, I've never seen that. Everyone stepped back except him. He stepped Toward me. Toward me. Five years ago, my wife had stepped toward me. She was the last person to do so, but now he did. I didn't move. I was frozen. I simply spoke, Lord, you can heal me if you will. If he had healed me with the word, I would have been thrilled. Had he cured me with the prayer, I would have rejoiced. But he wasn't satisfied with just speaking to me. He drew near. He extended his hand. And he touched me. Five years ago, my wife had touched me. No one had touched me since. I will be healed. His words were as tender as his touch. Energy just flooded my body like water through a furrowed field. In an instant, in a moment, I felt warmth where there had been numbness. I felt strength where there had been atrophy. My back straightened, my head lifted. Where I had been at eye level with his belt, I now stood eye level with his face. His smile. He cut my face in his hands, drew me so near that I could feel the warmth of his breath and see the wetness in his eyes. He sought quietly said, don't tell anyone about this, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded for people who are made well. This will show the people what I've done. So that's where I'm going. I'm going to show myself to my priest and embrace him. I'm going to show myself to my wife and embrace her. I'm going to pick up my daughter and embrace her. And I will never forget the one who dared to touch me. He could have healed me with the word. 
But he wanted to do more than just heal me. He wanted to honor me, to validate me, to christen me, if you will. Imagine that. Unworthy of the touch of a man. Yet worthy of the touch of God. There's something really unique about this story of healing that it's easy to miss. touch did not heal him. The touch did not heal him. Matthew's careful to mention that it was the pronouncement and not the touch of Christ that cured his condition. It says Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. Then he said, I will. Immediately, the man was healed from me. The infection, if you will, the disease was banished by a word from Jesus, but the loneliness, the isolation, the rejection, the fear, the anger, everything that had been going on in this man for however long he had had the disease was banished and treated by a touch. Oh, the power of a godly touch. Haven't you experienced it? Maybe it was a doctor who treated you. Or a teacher who dried your tears as a child. Maybe it was a hand holding yours at a funeral. Or another on your shoulder during a trial. Maybe it was that handshake of welcome at a new job or a pastoral prayer for healing. Haven't we all... Experience the power of a godly touch. <clears throat> Can't we offer the same? Many of you already do. And you're to be commended. Some of you have the master touch of the physician himself. Because you use your hands to pray over the sick and minister to the weak. If you aren't touching them personally, your hands are writing letters, dialing phones, baking pies. You've learned the power of But others of us tend to forget. Our hearts may be good, no doubt about that, but it's just that our memories are bad. We forget how significant touch can be. We fear saying the wrong thing or using the wrong tone or acting the wrong way. So rather than doing it incorrectly, we end up doing nothing at all. Aren't we glad Jesus didn't make the same mistake? If you fear... If your fear of doing the wrong thing prevents you from doing anything, keep in mind the perspective of the lepers of the world. They aren't picky. They aren't finicky. They're just lonely. They're yearning for that godly touch of someone to show a little compassion. Jesus touched. 